want to start off by telling us where we are and where the field laboratory is. The field lab uh, is near Chatsworth, Canoga Park, Calabasas, Agoura Hills, uh, Thousand Oaks, Moore Park, Simi Valley. Another map that shows you Oak Park here as well, Woodland Hills. Um, in addition, you should obviously know that it is elevated. It is um, on hills or mountains. And so it is above um, uh, us, and uh, that is influential because the water tends to want to go downhill, and the wind can blow the containers as well. So uh, abutting the facility is Grand Ive RD, also now known as United Jewish University, Runkle Canyon, a uh, housing development that's underway, Amundsen Ranch, uh, the Sage Ranch, uh, Dayton Canyon here, and we'll discuss it in a moment, uh, but for basically each of those, there has been uh, contamination found to have migrated off the field lab to those locations. The field lab itself is divided into four operational areas, area one, two, three, and four. There is a northern buffer zone and a southern buffer zone. But these are the operational areas. Area four was the nuclear area, where work was done primarily for the US Department of Energy, uh, previously the Atomic Energy Commission. NASA uh, administers and the US government owns area two and a portion of area one. Boeing owns and operates the rest of area one and area three. And essentially owns all of it, with the exception of the NASA property, DOE leased its land for the nuclear work there. The facility was established in the late 1940s for rocket testing. Um, it was uh, run by a company called North American Aviation, based in Downey. And it was uh, literally established as a field lab, a lab for work that was too dangerous to be done in Downey or the other urban centers that they subsequently opened uh, in Canoga Park. In 1949, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission undertook a search for a remote nuclear testing lab. Um, and the site was supposed to be in an area where population development was unlikely. They ranked the, a number of candidate sites, and San Jose was ranked fifth out of six sites for meteorological safety criteria. They just worried that the wind might blow the material to populated areas, but it was picked anyway because the driving time to UCLA where they thought many of their um, uh, people might also be uh, associated was uh, the shortest. Additionally, the power of the reactors was supposed to be limited to very, very small reactors so as to reduce dose to the nearby population, but a few years later that limit was set aside and a large test reactor was constructed. Uh, that didn't meet those criteria. This was the SRE, the one that had the partial meltdown. And now about half a million people reside within 10 miles. So within Area 4, again that westernmost area that we just saw, there were over the years 10 nuclear reactors. In addition, half a dozen nuclear criticality facilities, which are kind of small, uh, even smaller test reactors. A hot laboratory, and I'll show you a photograph in a moment, designed to cut up and examine irradiated reactor fuel that was shipped in from around the country. So the Department of Energy, the Atomic Energy Commission, shipped in uh, very large amounts of radioactivity in high-level waste in irradiated reactor fuel from DOE sites around the country. We also had a plutonium fuel fabrication facility and a uranium carbide facility to try to make plutonium and uranium carbide fuels. In addition, there was a sodium burn pit you heard that the SRE used sodium as a coolant, which burns in the presence of air and can explode if, if uh, water is dumped on it very quickly. Um, and many of the other reactors also use sodium. So they had components that became contaminated with sodium, which they then burned in these burn pits that were open air. There were a whole series of nuclear accidents. In 1959, the AE6 reactor released fission gases. Fission gases are gases that are radioactive materials from the fissioning of uranium. In 1959 was the par power excursion and partial meltdown of the SRE that we just discussed in the film. In 1964, a SNAP reactor, a space reactor, 
uh, operated for about a year with all sorts of signs of uh, 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 failure of fuel. But they kept re running it anyway, and when they finally shut it down, they found about 80% of the fuel had been damaged. And in 1969, almost an identical accident occurred with another SNAP reactor. Again, a year or so of clear indications of radioactivity releases and other releases, and they kept operating. Because in some sense, this was a uh, uh, frontier uh, uh, premise of trying to push reactors uh, to the limit, uh, which, if it were ever appropriate in a distant location, became less appropriate as people moved in uh, nearby. That hot laboratory had a number of radioactive fires, and there were numerous other spills and releases in Area 4. This is just to show you how we found out about the partial meltdown. Michael Rose, who uh, was introduced to you, who was a student at UCLA, was one of the students who helped come across these documents. That sounds pretty boring, radial cracks, longitudinal cracks. The melted blob was a complex engineering term that all of a sudden raised um, our <laughs> attention. And you'll see from these photographs, again, these are not our labels, these were the labels in the Atomic Energy Commission report, blob. Um, the fuel's not supposed to look that way, it's supposed to look like a nice smooth pipe. Uh, but uh, there was eutectic melting, and uh, the fuel was uh, severely damaged. Again, photos of the melted fuel. This is uh, Area 4, around 1951, as they started to uh, disturb the soil to be able to build these reactor buildings. And here's a photograph, um, which you saw part of on the uh, flyer, for those of you who got the flyer. And we're going to talk about this just for a moment. This is Area 4. So the SRE, the reactor that had that partial meltdown in 1959, was located here. The AE6, which had the release of fission gases some months before, was here. The Radioactive Materials Handling Facility, also sometimes called the Radioactive Materials Disposal Facility, uh, had a large uh, number of incidents where there was radioactive leakage. Uh, barrels of radioactive waste, uh, scores and scores of them, were left outside uh, uh, to in the rain and all the elements. And so leakage occurred from those barrels and ran off the ravine going down uh, towards the Brandeis. The SNAP-8 reactor was here. The ER, the one that had that accident in 1964. The SNAP-8 DR, the 69 accident, was here. Here was a thorium reactor. Here's the hot lab where they cut up the irradiated fuel. They also manufactured very large uh, radioactive sources um, involving thousands and tens of thousands of curies of radioactivity uh, to make very, very powerful irradiation sources. The plutonium building is here, where very large amounts of plutonium were handled, often in powdered form uh, and in metallic form, uh, to construct uh, plutonium fuels. Uh, so you see that it was an area in which a good deal of uh, reactor structures were uh, made, and where there were a fair number of accidents and other releases and spills. Uh, again, photos from the uh, uh, event of 1959, the press release claiming that essentially nothing had happened, a single part of fuel element, uh, they said, was observed, uh, and that there was no release of radioactive materials. Uh, and not an indication of safe operating conditions. They've been venting radioactive gases directly into the environment for uh, a, a month and a half at the time they were finally released the press release saying that they, nothing had gotten released. Just to understand, there was a core cover gas up here. There was no containment structure. So radioactivity made its way up there and then was potentially pumped out of the reactor and vented to the atmosphere because there was no containment. <coughs> this is what the hot lab looked like. The material that they were working with was so radioactive you couldn't get close to it, so you had to work on it remotely. So these were thick, thick glass with lead in them and then these were arms so you could remotely handle the material. Nonetheless, there were a number of fires involving radioactive material there. So uh, that was the activity that occurred in this, at the site on the nuclear side. Um, in 1986, the Chernobyl accident occurred. And I had been appointed by NRC Commissioner Asselstein to serve on a containment performance panel for the NRC meeting in Washington. Then the Chernobyl accident uh, resulted. I was called over to Capitol Hill and asked to brief some of the uh, committee uh, staff and ended up being asked to put together the first independent uh, uh, technical review 
of uh, the Department of Energy's Hanford end reactor, which was very similar to Chernobyl. We found uh, serious safety problems testified before a congressional committee. DOE then announced it was asking the National Academy of Sciences to review uh, not just Hanford, but also its Savannah River facility. The National Academy panel uh, concurred with our conclusions about Hanford. And all of a sudden, the entire DOE nuclear complex that had been operating under secrecy for decades came under scrutiny. And a large number of accidents and contamination events were found throughout the entire national DOE complex. DOE Secretary Admiral Walken said he was going to change the culture of secrecy at DOE, which had evolved out of the Manhattan Project, and drag it into a new culture of safety. That resulted in DOE sending to Santa Susana, among other DOE facilities, in this case they sent a man named Jim Werner, to review the Santa Susana uh, 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 situation. He found widespread radioactive and chemical contamination. This was 1989. Daily News got a copy of the study that was published, caused a lot of public concern. Uh, that led Congressman Gallagher to establish this panel to try to get DOE and the other agencies to uh, cooperate with each other and to be available to the public, uh, have uh, scrutiny and keep us informed. Um, and uh, it resulted in a Tiger team that found numerous violations also at the facility. Uh, but widespread contamination, which is what we're all about here today, which is to understand what radioactive contamination, what chemical contamination, and what progress is being made, if any, by the agencies on carrying out the commitments they've made um, under cleanup agreements to clean it up. So that's area four. In addition to the nuclear work, SSFL was home to more than 30,000 rocket engine tests, 30,000. Many of those were for the Department of Defense, for the Air Force nuclear missile program like the MX missile, for the Navy uh, uh, nuclear missiles, for the naval subs, and a fair amount for NASA. For some interesting reason, NASA has now gotten stuck with the cleanup, even though much of the contamination was from these Defense Department agencies. They tested rocket engines, um, and I say, as I said, tens of thousands of these, many of them using very toxic uh, uh, fuels and oxidizers. Hydrazine, uh, solid rocket fuels were tested as well or used, which contained perchlorate, another very toxic material we'll discuss in a moment. <laughs> so the site built test stands and mm -hmm. lots of tests, and that resulted in a large amount of contamination as well. But what happened is after there was a test, they would flush out the rocket engines with TCE, trichloroethylene, a very toxic solvent. <coughs> and then just let the TCE run off into the soil and percolate, percolate into the ground and into the groundwater. Some of the TCE went off into the air, which was also uh, toxic, and some of it went down into the uh, groundwater. It is estimated that about a million gallons of TCE were dumped this way, and about um, half of that is in the groundwater. Uh, it's dangerous at levels of five parts per billion. So here are the TCE plumes, and you can see that the plumes have actually migrated off site. They've also gone down as deep into the profile as uh, anywhere else in North America. There was other contamination of groundwater because of improper handling of the chemical wastes, uh, the underground storage tanks, and so on. You're not supposed to drink any of the water on the property because it's so contaminated. Uh, eventually, they also created a burn pit for the chemical wastes where they took barrels and barrels of waste and with a gun, with a rifle, shot at them to ignite them in the open air and burned the toxic waste in that fashion month after month uh, because they said it was too much trouble to be, take it to a off-site disposal site. That was that memo I just passed through quickly. I need to uh, rush to my conclusion here. In the mid-90s, two workers were killed in an explosion uh, the facility told the regulators that this was uh, research that they were doing that went awry. The FBI raided the facility, took off box loads of documents, uh, concluded that they had not been told the truth, that this was illegal disposal of hazardous materials, prepared uh, charges against the company. Rock and I eventually admitted that it wasn't research, was, was illegal disposal, pled guilty to three felony charges of illegal disposal, paid the largest environmental fine in California history to that time. So you've got volatile organics like TCE, semi-volatiles, heavy metals, dioxins, PCBs, perchlorate, and groundwater, surface water, soil contamination. 
and you are going today to hear in more detail about each of those. In a moment, you're going to hear from EPA about its multi-year, $40 million study of the radioactive contamination in Area 4. Thereafter, you're going to hear from NASA about the hazardous materials that were employed in their areas, the accidents and spills that uh, uh, released those materials and the contamination, the particular materials that uh, contaminate particular areas, and the uh, health effects. And DTSC will similarly cover that material, that kind of information, but including also uh, areas uh, three and the Boeing part of area one. So, uh, just quickly on the offside contamination, it has been found at Brandeis Bardeen. There's been Strontium 90 found in Runkle Canyon. The Amundsen project ended in small part because of some uh, findings of contamination on it. And the Dayton Canyon ended up with huge concentrations of perchlorate in Dayton Creek. Uh, so, what we're now going to hear is from EPA about what they have found in terms of the remaining radioactive contamination in Area 4. Here's a quick, uh, summary chart from them of the radionuclides they found, and then we've graphed some of it to show how much about background some of um, the uh, findings are. So I'm going to now hand it over to Mary Acock from EPA, who will present to you about this multi-year study to determine where the contamination is, what radionuclides, and how much. Thank you very much.